We'll move on to, well, we have our guest speaker that we'll be introducing momentarily. So I guess that's all of us for today. And we have several announcements. First of all, belated happy anniversary to Allie and Aaron. Uh, 19 years of marriage on October 6th. I can only imagine, Allie, I know you're there somewhere, that you were a child bride. <laughs> because you don't look old enough to have been married for 19 years. <laughs> so, so, and, and if for some reason, I know, oh, there she is. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that she knew we were acknowledging her. Now, one of the uh, main announcements for today has to do with this year's Polio Plus campaign, World Polio Day is October 24th, and the district will commemorate it for the whole week leading up for October 17th to October 24th. Last year, under Diane's leadership, this club placed first in the entire district out of, I think it was 67 clubs. And the theme last year was the Red High Top Challenge. And Don Nelson's generous contribution helped put us over the top. So you could say that we have big shoes to fill this year. And again, this year, this district's Rotary Club and really Rotary Clubs around the world are celebrating World Polio Day with special fundraising activities. Now things will be done differently this year I want to also explain that Polio Plus, in addition to addressing issues related to polio, will also encompass cholera, SARS, Ebola, COVID-19, H1N1, which is the swine flu, and malaria. Each club this year will come up with its own theme. And we will create and implement our own campaigns and the activities can be completely virtual. In fact, mostly will be. And also what's different this year is that we get to work with a fundraising tool called Give Some. Give Some is actually an outside company authorized by Rotary. They work with nonprofits to help them with fundraising events. And I see Allie back in the uh, waiting room. Okay, we'll admit her for sure. Um, so each club will have its own fundraising page. We can go onto the page and check out how we're doing. Donations can be made virtually on that page or checks can be sent in as well. And so they're going to be explaining more details about the administration very shortly. There will be prizes for the most money raised and for the most creative activity. This year, Rotary International has created the new Polio Plus Society, which will recognize donors who give at least $100. And what will be unique this year as well is that money given during that week can have a tremendous impact. So up to uh, and including October 24th, donations of 100 or more will be matched two to one by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And then Rotary will match another 100. So a $100 donation can turn into a $400 donation very easily. So it's very powerful. And since we get to choose our own theme, I am proposing that this year our club honor the memory of Don Nelson and Don Park. Wonderful, I agree. Oh good, oh good. I'm glad you like that idea. So I will be following up with you shortly with more of the logistics. I'm receiving those from the district leadership and they're going <coughs> to help set up the, the page that we have and the, and the procedures but this will be an opportunity for us not to only show our continuing love and respect for these men, but it will also be 
actions that will live in memory forever. These will always be on record as having been accomplished in their name. So I will be following up with you more about that. Nancy? Yeah. Yes. Nancy, it's Steve. Um, I believe, and I, I, I don't know for sure, but this will entitle the members to get recognition points towards Paul Harris Fellows as well. Polio Plus is one of the, as well as the annual oh, funder. Oh, yes. Thank so, you. I'll confirm that, but I believe you're right. I believe yeah. you're correct about that. Right. So that's wonderful. So a lot of good can be accomplished. Tremendous amount of money can be raised. Everybody's impact can be multiplied and the points are valuable uh, as you have demonstrated to us. So th I will confirm that, but that sounds like that would be, that would be the case. Thank you, Steve. You're welcome. And then while we have Steve on screen, we have also the District 5280 Foundation Celebration coming up on uh, November 7th. We have three silent auction baskets. Uh, they've told me that the descriptions of the baskets are due on October 16th, but they haven't yet worked out all of the other details. So I don't know yet when they need that physical items. And I will be following up with you as soon as I get that information. So it is about a month away. So, uh, so we have plenty of time. And I, as I said, we'll be talking about this further. Camp Pendleton Collection Day has been re being repeated this month. The July collection drive was such a success that they decided to do it again. There will be four collection sites. And again, I will have more details shortly. This, and they will also be posted on the district website. As a reminder, there are more than 70,000 Marines stationed at Camp Pendleton. There are 160 babies born to these Marine families every month. And there are more than 10,000 children, here comes Sally, under the age of five that live at Camp Pendleton. So clearly they need our help and, and, and it's a truly wonderful cause. So if anybody's interested, let me know and we can coordinate our efforts. Uh, I just got a notice the other day about this year's youth conference will be held on October 17th. It will be virtual, of course, and, and it will be, and I'm sorry, I have to let Ellie in again. <laughs> and it will be an afternoon's worth of events. This is all the information I have at the moment, but I'm sure that since this is to be done in about a week and a half, we'll be getting more quickly in case anybody is interested. And with that, I would like to introduce our speaker for today, Tom. Yes, I'm right here, ready to go. Great, right. right. wonderful. Over to you, Tom. Okay, okay thank you. Why, uh, <clears throat> why don't you set up Till with his as the host so he yes. can have his feature. Yes. Meanwhile, I'll just go ahead with the introduction. I was reading the UCLA publication about this uh, group um, headed up by Professor Till Von Wachter, and it was in a UCLA publication. We thought it was really interesting because it, he, uh, Till is an economics professor here at UCLA and is the faculty director of the California Policy Lab and is also associate dean for research at the Division of Social Sciences here at UCLA. Um, <laughs> Till is one of the leading researchers in the country focused on unemployment, labor market conditions and the impact of unemployment and job loss on workers' long-term earnings and health incomes, and the role of unemployment and disability insurance in cushioning these financial shocks. Uh, since the start of COVID-19 pandemic, Till has been leading a small team of UCLA researchers to analyze unemployment claims in California using data from the Employment Development Department. The monthly reports have been covered by the LA Times, New York Times, Washington Post, CNBC, and many other outlets. In other words, it's a real resource UCLA has here on the employment situation. Through his research, Till and his team have given many state policymakers a near real-time picture 
of the labor crisis in California, as well as the strategies to address the crisis. Um, he and his team have produced seven reports and written about unemployment claims in California during the COVID-19 pandemic. And he has sent me these three um, report links and I will put them in the windmill or I'll have someone put them in the windmill until um, one covers the unemployment insurance claims, another one covers the uh, federal pandemic unemployment compensation. And uh, another one is the lost wages assistance program in California. All three reports will be available in, uh, in, um, in the windmill or some feature going out to all the members so they can access the information. With that, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Till Von Walker. Till, you're on. Till? <laughs> you're, um, Till, you're on mute. Mute, Till. Excellent. There you are. Can you hear me? Yes. Fantastic. Thank you so much for the generous introduction, Tom. And thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here. And I should say, just before the prizes, I uh, received U.S. citizenship, um, which was a, a big deal together with my wife. And I think, believe today was the first time that I got to actually say the Pledge of Allegiance, because uh, since then there hasn't been an opportunity. So that that meant a lot to me. And I, I should say, my kids would be thrilled if I told them that, that I was part of a Zoom meeting where we sang together, because they, of course, think that my Zoom meetings are all eternally boring um, and all about economics. So that'll be fun. And my daughter is actually an avid singer. She's part of the National Children's Choir that happens at, at UCLA. So if you, if you should have a, ever have me back, maybe to talk about homelessness, I can bring her along and she can uh, sing something Sing the buffalo on the range, for example. Anyway, with that with that said, um, why, why don't we dive right in? Um, as Tom said, uh, my name is Tilton Wachter. I'm a professor of economics, and uh, I am the director here at UCLA of a new institute called the California Policy Lab, and I'll talk a bit more about that. And I'm also the associate dean for research of the social science division. And I don't know how you typically do it. I'm happy for you to, you know raise questions, but I was also asked to leave a chunk of time for questions at the end. And what I thought I was going to do is a little bit about some exciting developments at UCLA, uh, uh, the California Policy Lab and what it does. And then I was going to give you a sort of a, a very high level summary of our unemployment insurance reports. And that's a, a, an extract from a presentation that I gave before the Labor Secretary not too long ago. So you'll, you'll be briefed, so to speak. And then I'll talk a bit about labor market policy, especially what happened uh, it, from the CARES Act and especially the $600. Excuse uh, me, Professor. Can you hold on one second? Uh, Professor, hold on one second. Everyone, please mute your mics. There's two people that don't have their mics muted. Please mute yourself. Thanks. Uh, and and I, so. I'll, I'll talk a bit about the $600 supplement and economic effects. And then at the end, I'll come back to sort of talk a bit about where, where we stand and where we might be going from here. With that, with that said, um, I'm just gonna dive right in um, and uh, see whether you have any questions alongside. Otherwise, I'll, I'll look forward to the conversation at the end. Um, so let's see. Okay, right, here we go. So, the California Policy Lab is, is a new institute and we have two sites, one at uh, UCLA and one at Berkeley. And the idea here is to generate evidence that transforms public policy. Well, that idea is not new, of course, but we're doing things in a little bit of a different way. And so what we try to do, we try to work together with uh, California government agencies, both at the city, local or state level and develop long-term research partnerships. And that way we want to make sure that we actually work on things that can help the agencies and really make a difference on the ground. We can also help and implement some of our findings. And at the same time, we can get access to, you know, extraordinary data that allows us to, you know, find out new things that you couldn't otherwise because many agencies collect a lot of data, but they're not using it. They, they simply don't have the time or the expertise. And the idea for this lab really originated in the last big recession 
the Great Recession 10 years ago, where I gave a bunch of uh, congressional testimonies. I wrote, you know, summaries of my research, and I felt it felt very involved. But the, the impact of all this research and and outreach was very intermediate. And the same was true for my colleague Jesse Watson at Berkeley. And we thought, well, if we're really going to do research that affects policy and makes lives better for people on the ground, right? We have to do things differently. And hence was the California Policy Lab. Uh, uh, was born. And our idea is we're completely funded by third parties. So when we work for government partners, it's for free. So we don't, you know, we maintain our independence, we maintain our high academic standards, and we don't depend on government contracts. Uh, um, and so can can do the best research for any given situation. And we work in different sectors. Today, you're going to hear a lot about labor and employment. But our other big area in, in UCLA is, of course, homelessness. Um, and we work on issues related to social, social safety net, criminal justice, and education and expanding into health. And of course, the idea here is that you can't sort of address any of these topics separately, that there's so many pieces that interact here that we needed these five broad areas that all involve different staff members and different policy members, uh, uh, faculty members here at UCLA and Berkeley and throughout the UC system, really. And uh, the, the, I guess the good news was that when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, we were ready uh, to act. And, and here, I'm just gonna give you a very quick overview of what we've been doing um, during the pandemic. And today I'll talk in depth about our monthly unemployment insurance claims reports um, that we do in partnership with the California Department of Labor. But we have also analyzed the impact of the crisis on you know, workers working in small businesses. We have done some in-depth work on the homeless and helped the county to you know, roll out COVID-19 screening for the homeless. Um, We're working on making sure or understanding who got the stimulus payments uh, in, the, in April and who didn't because they don't file taxes. And we're monitoring you know, households financial uh, uh, stability because we were able to build up a data set that really allows us to sort of understand in depth, you know, how indebtedness is being affected by the crisis. And we could spend, you know, the, the rest of the day about any of these topics, and, and I'm just going to zoom in. But the, the, the good news here is that we were really able, by establishing these long-run partnerships, to be there and to help once the crisis hit. Um, and, and one way we helped is to provide more information about the unemployed. And as many of you know, right, unemployment insurance is a program that pays somebody who lost their job through no fault of their own, a weekly stipend until they find another job. And that weekly stipend, the unemployment benefits, is a fraction of the prior wage. And that fraction is at most 50% in, in, in typical times. And in this crisis, uh, there were several changes that we'll discuss later that affected unemployment insurance. Um, but the thing to know is that the number of new claims for unemployment insurance, meaning the number that come in every week and say they, they would like to get benefits is a closely watched leading indicators at the federal and state level. The reason is that most of what we know about the labor market and the economy comes in from very large national surveys once a month. And there's very little data at the higher frequency, but the UI claims are observed at the daily level, really. And the Department of Labor publishes a weekly press release that everybody watches intently. And what was very interesting to us that all we know for California every week then is the number of new claims. We don't know whether these are men or women, which industry they're from, what age group, whether they're highly educated or not. And we were already working with this data at the Department of Labor for several research projects. And we approached them and said, well, we could actually learn at a daily or weekly level much more about who is being hit by the crisis. And that way, this is information that can be used to better target services. And we can do that for California as a whole but we also can do that for every neighborhood in California because we have access to the entire 
data. And of course, I don't have access to the data here on my computer. This is all done in secure facilities at the Department of Labor. And you know, this this is these we, uh, monthly reports have gotten a lot of press and and uh, attention uh, because they provided really genuinely new information. So this is an excerpt here of a, a brief presentation before the Labor Secretary that gives you a sense of the crisis, right? And you know, I, I'll be partly reviewing things that you know, right? But this picture shows you for every week since uh, late February, the number of people who claimed for unemployment insurance benefits, which is not the same as the people who actually got benefits, but this is a, so a, the number of people who got laid off, that's how you can think about it, that claimed. And that was, there was just a huge spike starting in mid-February where, and, and these are numbers just for California, where in just a few weeks, there were two to three million new, new claims. And just to get a sense of the scale of what was happening, we, the red line is the worst week during the last recession, the so-called great recession. And as oh, you I'm remember- sorry, can I interrupt you for just, a, is anybody, I'm not seeing your screen. Is anybody else oh. seeing it? I, who I'm is- seeing it. I see it. I see it fine. Yes, I, can see I see it fine. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm, that's fine then if everyone else can see it. Maybe I can see it on the recording. I'm not seeing it. No, sometimes what it happens, if you do a screen share, it goes to a separate window on your computer. So if you scroll to the side or you Got flick it. between okay. windows, that can happen. Okay, thank you. Um, so oh, hold on, I'm, I'm moving too fast. So what, what you see here is a, is a picture with showing on the horizontal axis, calendar weeks since February until end of August, and a very big spike in new claims in March and April. And then this line drops, but it never goes below the worst week of the Great Recession. And if you remember, the Great Recession was the biggest recession since the Second World War up to then. Mm -hmm. So that means that our recovery that happened in May and June was always worse than the worst time of the last recession. And that was true until August. And here's a piece that is not on the figure, but of course this is discussed in depth in the report. A new claim can be when you got laid off for the first time, or if you got laid off, found a job again, and then you got laid off again. That's called an additional claim. And the good news in August was that we, we talk about that in our last report, that the fully new claims of people who had never gotten unemployment insurance during the crisis finally dipped below the Great Recession peak. And the gap that you see here between the dark blue line and, and, and the, the red line is just from additional claims. So we have a, a high amount of people who get rehired and get laid off again as businesses find out that maybe work or, or demand wasn't good enough. The other thing you see here is the dash line and that these are the number of claims of a new program it's called pandemic unemployment assistance. And this program was for people who were self-employed who had never paid into the system. So if you're self-employed, many of you know that you're not automatically covered by unemployment insurance or disability insurance. But in this crisis, the government felt that we should help out these workers. And there was this new program. And I can talk about that a little bit later on. It's a very complicated program. And many of you may have heard that end of August, there was a, do you see this spike? That's probably due to fraud, but that's something we're not involved with that. We just think about the economics of the whole thing. So this is to set the stage. And the beauty of our report is that we can go beyond this figure, right? And really look at sort of who, was claiming benefits. And that's what you see in the next figure here. And, you know, this focus on the first bar, this, 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 the colored lines here bar show you the fraction of workers that filed benefits since mid-March, the beginning of the crisis. Um, and the first bar, the dark blue one is for the state. And you have 40% of unemployment insurance claims filed uh, of, of, of the 40% 40, 40 of the labor force in California filed for an unemployment insurance claim. And at any point between mid-March and end of August, if you had asked me as a labor economist, whether I would ever see sort of a 20% claim rate 
during a recession, I would have said probably never. Because usually at most 10% of the, of the labor force files for unemployment insurance. And so seeing 40% of people having filed, that's just staggeringly large. And it's, it's uh, very concerning, but also not a surprise if you know what happened during the crisis, that these, the, the, uh, the unemployment and the claiming is concentrated among lower wage workers. So almost, you know, uh, uh, over one in two workers with just a high school degree filed for benefits. One in two, over one in two young workers filed and two thirds of African-American workers filed for benefits during this crisis. And the reason this is so concentrated among those who are typically lower wage, which means the young, the lower educated and non-whites um, is that those are often employed in lower wage sectors, which in this case was the retail industry and accommodation and food, sort of restaurants and hotels. And those were two sectors, as you know, that were immediately and drastically affected by the shutdown orders that were put in place to fight the pandemic. And so we have the unusual situation that we have workers coming into the unemployment insurance system that are much lower wage than usual. Because in a typical recession, people will stop buying cars, they stop buying fridges. So people will stop spending on big ticket items, but they have a bit more money left. And actually they may go out more to restaurants and go more you know, shopping for necessities and so on. So the, the restaurant and accommodation and food sector and the retail sectors are sort of safe sectors during recessions because people still need a haircut, right? Still, people, people still, go shopping. Well, in this crisis, it was the other way around, right? And so now we're seeing workers hit by the system that usually don't rely on unemployment insurance benefits. And, and that's something that we come back to because for these workers benefits are just very, very low. Because, and since they're low income, they spend most of their income on rent and necessities. So there isn't much slack here. And 50% of prior earnings won't get them really through the month. Um, unless they have other sources of income. So I'll, I'll get back to that. Bill, can I just ask a quick question? Absolutely. Uh, I'm looking at the bar graphs. Is there a correlation between the gen, the, the lower age Gen Z and the black workers and Hispanics? Because the, the, these are the three tallest bars. So if they are captured in the Gen Z, are they double counted in the blacks and the Hispanics? That, that is an excellent question. And, and, and this is sort of the type of question that we, we try to keep the report very accessible to everyone. And so we don't necessarily go and address cross correlation, but we have of course looked at that. We have of course looked at that. Or do, are we missing, you know, are there, is there some correlation here that could explain these patterns? And we know that young workers and low wage workers are very affected by recessions, even slicing it say by race or by educational status. Um, what can explain these patterns is their, the differences across sectors. So within sectors, right, white young workers or black workers or lower educated workers have a, a, a lower claim rate. It is because they're all employed in retail sales, accommodation, food and personal services. But that, that's an excellent question. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you, Kiel. I was on mute just to uh, get yeah. the frequency up. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and that's, of course, the first thing you check when you see a figure like this. Uh, do we have three messages about young, blacks, and, and lower educated, or is it all driven by one group? And these are three. All of these three groups are very highly affected. So let me turn just a, a moment to LA, because one thing we're working on right now is uh, to bring this analysis of workers and claimants to the local level. And here's you know, some of the very large counties and LA County has a very high fraction of workers uh, that, that file for unemployment insurance benefits. And so uh, the, 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 if you wanna focus just on the last column, sorry, this is a, a table right of the report. So there's a lot of information here. 
but about 5 million workers, this is the next to last column, were in the labor force in LA in February. And you can look at, you know, a bit less than half of those who were in the labor force in February have filed for unemployment insurance benefits in Los Angeles. So that means a lot of workers are relying on unemployment insurance uh, or have relied on un unemployment insurance at some point during the crisis in Los Angeles. And of course, you know that LA County is, is a very large, very diverse county. And so what we have done and are working on, we're starting to break this down and really drilling down to the neighborhood level. So what I'm showing you are two maps. The maps uh, uh, on the left is the, the map of the all counties in the state. Um, but I, I want you to focus briefly on the map on the right, which is of course a, a map of LA County. And here the shading represents how many workers on average have applied for benefits in a different neighborhood. Really, these are neighborhoods, these are so-called census tracts, which is sort of a technical definition that makes sure that every one of these neighborhoods has roughly the same number of people so we can get a decent amount of measure, measurement uh, precision. But it's clear from this picture that there is some concentration where you might expect it to be. So in, in downtown Los Angeles and uh, in East Los Angeles, there's possibly also some missing mass. Namely, there are some Hispanic neighborhoods here that look like they have too few claims from what you would have expected. Right? Um, and so that is something we're working on and uh, we will put out the detailed maps over the coming weeks. And um, this takes a, a lot of work. We have two people at the Department of Labor working on this and a team of three people working on this uh, uh, in, in, at UCLA when nobody's, everybody's uh, telecommuting, of course, but to, to, to you get these fine measures at the, at the local level. And these measures will be very useful, not only to understand where are the hotspots in the county or in the state, we, we have um, local uh, policymakers who are knocking at our door and asking who's hurting, right? Who, who, who will be, has been most affected by the loss in the $600 a week supplement or by the, the, the end of the uh, lost wages assistance program. And, and that's what I will be talking about next. Right? But I just wanted to give you sort of a, a bird's eye view what you can do with the data if you have the ability to go more and use with the source of the data itself. And you can really do a fine grained assessment of which workers were hurt and where, which allows you to do much better policy. Well, can I ask a second question if I may? Sure. The, the finer detail, geographic detail, how does that help in a blunt instrument such as a stimulus? How can you target a neighborhood through a stimulus given that the, the supplement or the stimulus is fairly wide in, uh, in definition and broad in application? So that's a very good question. I'm, I'm, I'm about to start talking a bit about labor market policies and we can come back to that, but just briefly, there's sort of several ways you can think about this. One, one way, is of course these the, the, the federal programs are aimed at everyone, but not everybody receives them in the same way, right? And, and so you can then look at where do we have the most unemployed and have the, the funds really flowed to that areas or are there some areas that for some reason or another have not received as much federal support, right? And then you can go and see, well, what might the reasons be, right? And that will usually depend on the program. Um, the, the, another question is that the state itself has some more targeted resources that uh, 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 there are not many, and we'll talk about that. Um, but the question is, can we be more focused on outreach for certain programs if, if we believe there's sort of a lack of participation? And finally, there's some almost grassroots efforts of, of uh, policymakers at the local level that try to the best of their ability to you know, obtain funds to shore up people's finances or individuals uh, organizing food banks. So that the first request for this data was in April by an organization that was getting ready to 
organize food banks across the state and wanted to know where the lines would be longest, right? This was before the CARES Act was passed. And, you know, the concern with food banks has sort of uh, uh, died down. Now we're back where we might get requests. But you see, there's different level at which this fine geographic data could be, could be useful. Great. Thank well, you. Uh, I would be, I just want to, until when would you like me to speak? Is, is, do you, when, when do you want me to stop? Our, our meeting ends at 12.30, so you- 1.30. I'm at sorry, <laughs> thank you, 1.30. Okay. So depending on how much there, time uh, you need, let's see, it's already 1.12. So uh, if you, do you want to talk for five more minutes and then take yes, questions? I, I will do that and then I'll turn it over to discussion. That, that sounds great. Great, that's fine, thank you. So um, just one more point on the data, uh, and this is more for the, the people who like statistics, um, but you should take a look at the New York Times article on, on our report, because the way the government counts the unemployed is uh, very antiquated. It's not, not a surprise to you if you have sort of worked in, in either state or, or federal government, but there are some really important issues here that the report has, has, has helped to bring to light. And, and it's, a, it's a very readable New York Times piece. I recommend it to you. Um, but with, with the little time left, I was asked to talk a little bit about labor market policy. And I want to do that. And as you know, right, they, they, in, in, in April, um, a big stimulus act was passed. That was a third of a series of stimulus acts uh, where over $2 trillion were spent. And this act essentially took the classic playbook of how the government responds to a recession and you know, increased it a notch because of the pandemic, okay? And what was most unusual here was that a new program for the self-employed was instituted. That usually only happens in disasters. And so the, the, the pandemic was treated like a disaster, uh, um, like a natural disaster. And then there was a, a new program, which was called the Federal Pandemic Unemployment Compensation Program. Or for most people just know that there were, was a $600 a week supplement for everybody who was getting benefits. And I wanna just talk about that because that has led to a lot of head scratching and has been also a, a, a matter of debate. And I should say in every recession, this point of the generosity of unemployment insurance benefit ends up being hotly debated, right? And that was, the case 10 years ago and was the case today. Let me show you what the $600 did. And I just want to focus, you to focus on the question, on the figure. And the figure shows you that the blue line, that's the typical benefit amount for a week. And so during the crisis, the typical worker received about $345 a week. But if you were working in restaurants or in retail sale, the low wage sectors, you got about 277 a week. We don't know what else people have to go by, but if you just look at unemployment insurance benefits, those benefits put you below the federal poverty line, put you below the very low income threshold of the federal department for housing and urban development. And really, if, if you know how expensive California is, even in the lower wage areas, th that is a very low amount of money. Now, what happens with $600? a week on top of it, well, you put people up to the low income threshold. So the, the $600 really did two things. It prevented widespread hardship and it funneled about $51 billion into the California economy. And these are two things we want in recessions. Mm -hmm. We want people not to you know, sell their houses and have their kids start to work because to make ends meet, right? Or not go to the doctor and we want them to spend. And uh, that's what happened. And the big head scratch here, Ken, is to say, if you give somebody who was earning $600 a week, $600 a week plus their benefits of 200 or $300, they're gonna be making more as unemployed as they were before the crisis. The same amount or even more. And that's a concern uh, uh, because we're, we're worried Whenever we give unemployment insurance benefits in every recession, and even in normal times, we're worried that people don't look hard enough for a job. 
And the short answer is, because I want to I wanna leave some time for discussion, is that the studies that have looked at this, and we actually have a study that's in progress, we don't find this effect, meaning the $600 doesn't really have an effect on the time you spend in unemployment. And, and so the preliminary evidence here suggests that this, this supplement did what it was supposed to do, prevented hardship and it funneled a bunch of money into the economy to, to increase spending um, and prevent a further recession. And why didn't it, why would workers still want to return to a job that now pays them less? Well, there are several reasons. First of all, there were very few jobs available during the time and everybody knew that this program was ending temporarily. So between having a job at hand, right? And going back to a very uncertain labor market and knowing that in end of July, the program was turned off. I think it looks like most workers, you know, if they had a job offer, they would turn to work. But, but this is really, uh, uh, these are things that are in, in progress and we'll, we're gonna learn much more. I'm gonna stop here. I was gonna talk a little bit about, you know, what's the outlook for the California economy coming down the pipeline and how that is, how is that gonna affect uh, workers? Uh, and I have a new, uh, a couple of new studies that are being published on these potential long-term consequences of a big recession for labor market entrants, for job losers, and, and what that means for them and the labor market as a whole. But I'm gonna stop here and leave that to the discussion. Um, I'm happy to talk about policy options or what the outlook could be or any of your questions. Does anybody have a question? I do. Great, go yeah. ahead. Professor, it, it sounds like you're leaning towards uh, towards the conclusion that the $600 benefit was, was, not, was not keeping people from going back to work. You think bottom line people would still like to go back to work at a job, even if they might even be making less. I know Congress has had a problem with that. I think the Republicans have felt it's, it's motivating people to stay home and the other side says, pay them the money when they need it and they'll go back to work when they can get a job. You're leading that direction, is that correct? Well, you know, th I, th let me rephrase that slightly. I, I, I'm more, I look at the evidence and tell you what, what can the evidence tell us at the current moment, right? right. It, it's less a matter of opinion. The interesting piece here is this was a big discussion in the Great Recession where we had unemployment insurance that, uh, uh, whose maximum duration was close to two years. And people were very, very worried that giving people two years of unemployment insurance benefits would lead to long-term unemployment and prevent them from going back to work. So in, in a way, the, the economics profession has spent 10 years thinking about this question and how to, both how to think about it conceptually from the, the theory as well, what to do empirically. And based on the evidence that we had since the Great Recession and what we know now, uh, you know, the, the best guess is that it, it didn't really affect the, the, the return to work. Okay, thank you. Good question. Any more questions? Uh, professor, I, um, I have a trouble with that because I've read several articles. I, I am not an expert by any means, but I've read several articles where during the Great Recession that the benefits allocated, that the benefits precluded people from going back to work. Why wouldn't that same principle apply here in the, during the pandemic? Well, you know, you, I, I, just let me say, you, have, you are both, you know, pressing at the right point. This is sort of the crucial point for unemployment insurance in every cycle, right? We, we always trade off, and actually with any social insurance program, the benefit from providing people insurance, right? We all pay our payroll taxes or the firm pays for us and we, we, it goes through our wages and we self-insure by paying these payroll taxes so that when we get laid off, we get some benefits. That's the benefit. And the cost is that it may prevent some workers to look for a job harder because they're, they're making some money while they're not being unemployed. So I, I really like this discussion. So just to make, in terms of language, unemployment insurance benefit never preclude you from going back to work. 
they you don't get benefits when you're back at work unless you're doing part-time work so there is a program called partial unemployment insurance where while you're looking for a full-time job you can work part-time that is a is a drawback of unemployment insurance uh, and and there are better programs and i've been i've actually worked with the california uh, uh, assembly member to pass a bill uh, it was just signed by the governor last week that would make applications for a different program easier that's called work sharing so the idea here is that in a, a firm who needs to reduce their hours worked instead of laying off a fraction of employees meaning reducing their hours to zero it takes a broader group of workers and reduces everybody's hours say by 20 or 30 percent the workers get a share of their lost income from unemployment insurance but they remain employed and that keeps workers employed and it keeps firms active and is a program that is used almost everywhere else in the world to great effect especially in in in, the, in this crisis where we don't think that businesses were not viable we you know we had to stay home because of the pandemic and in the us work sharing hasn't been used very much instead we had the payment protection program that gave business loans that where the outcome of is very uncertain but work sharing is sort of a, a system that works really well and i prefer that to unemployment insurance um, unemployment insurance leads some workers to maybe stay home a couple of weeks longer that's always the case but these effects aren't very large or not large enough than the benefits so it's it's a trade-off here between costs and benefits and there's always some costs and the question is do the costs outweigh the benefits or the benefits outweigh the costs and on average in, in in recessions most economists would say the benefits tend to outweigh the cost professor i'm sorry i'm asking another question in in terms of the unemployment benefits can they be twinned up from your point of view as a policy institute for retooling or taking a course investing in that labor while it's still idle and cashing unemployment we so, have all of that so that's a, a another very good question and i've written a couple of papers on reforming the unemployment insurance system and you're sort of hitting all the important points here right one point we discussed is this issue that you're paying people for being not employed instead of paying them for remaining on the job another issue is that in the us you only get benefits if you're looking for a full-time job but if you're doing a training course during the daytime you're by definition not available for a full-time job you're in training and so you're not allowed to to do full-time training or retooling while you're getting ui benefits so I'm hoping that you know whoever is going to be in charge over the next few years will you know take a serious stab at reforming the system and to think about how can we help workers make use of that time while they're idle and learn some new skills. That program exists. It's it's uh, it's used in trade adjustment assistance. So if a, if a, if you know an industry is being really affected by changes in trade policy then people get benefits and they're allowed to look for a new job because people, we know that their industry is going out of business in regular unemployment insurance that's not the case and a lot of economists think that that's not a good idea so we, we could probably do better thank you I have, I, I have another question um yeah. till when you when congress passes a, a you know the benefit programs any type of unemployment insurance or anything else like that do the people that work the numbers come to you or do do they have data available to support their congressmen because congressmen don't look at it they pass a bill based upon what the staff tells them to uh, deal with. but do they do enough research to justify their level of payments and benefits etc yeah you want to know is a good question how is the sausage made um <laughs> the the bill sausage and you know, whoever opens sausages, it's always kind of messy. Uh, um, so they, they, they are staffers, as, as you'd rightly say, and the staffers are in touch with, you know, academics or 
policymakers, and there's sort of a various rings like an onion, right? If you work at a think tank in Washington DC, right, you go out to lunch with the staffers, right? And you write briefs that are exactly focused on what they need. So that's the first rank, right? Then there are policymakers that are very, the academics that are very active. And, you know, and then there are policy ac academics that keep doing academic work, but are experts, right? And so the information is passed on through these rings and plays a role, um, but not always, uh, you know, th these bills get to be extremely complex. And so mistakes are made, um, if, I may, if I dare say. And, and there's a lot of political negotiations. So good ideas are sometimes, fall sometimes through the cracks. And, you know, academics like me and our peers who write letters and op-eds and uh, summary papers, we, you know, we, we pull our hair. <laughs> and then sometimes good ideas get, get, get through. It, it, it's, it's not an exact science, I have to, I have to say. Uh, um, so I give you an example. So the $600 came by because there's a firm belief that you can't, because if you raise benefits, every state has to do that. And there's a firm belief that 50 states wouldn't raise benefits or be able to raise benefits within a short period of time. Mm -hmm. So you do something crazy, which is give people $600 rather than making the benefits a function of their income. And so since then, you know, there has been this soul searching of whether maybe states could actually do the right thing instead of a more systematic account of what our options are. It, it, it's been quite, quite interesting to, to follow that debate. And in other way, yeah, go, go ahead. I have a follow-up question to that. Uh, yeah. would, a, would, a, would a wage earner who earns $40,000 a year in California receive the same un basic unemployment benefit as someone in uh, Alabama? Who earned the same amount of money? So that's a very good question. The answer is not, not quite, but because every state has a different benefit schedule. So what I most states give 50% of income up until the maximum. And it's the maximum that differs across states. And it's also the duration, how long you get it, that differs across states. Mm. But benefits are typically not you know, adjusted to cost of living differences across states. Oh, boy. Professor, I have a brief question about uh, work sharing. Yeah. If we can go back there for a second. Sure. Uh, under that model, if, if I understood correctly, the employer uh, applies for work sharing for certain employees or group of employees, and then the government shares in the cost of that employee who continues to work. Is that, is that correct understanding? That is the understanding. If that's true, what's to prevent any or every employer for saying, gee, this sounds like a good idea. I would like the government to share in the cost of my employees. So that, that is a good question. And by the way, um, I'm gonna come back to your question, but the, the process of how the wage insurance bill got passed in California is a, is a good example of how academics can work with policymakers. Because I was involved relatively early on in discussing Mm -hmm. The effects of you know streamlining work sharing applications, and then I tested. Well, I'm sorry, may I inter interrupt you for just a second? I'm, and oh. I apologize. Uh, it's 1:30. I know that some people will need to leave, so please feel free to do so until if you're uh, willing and able to stay with us for a few more minutes to finish answering your question. That would be great. Absolutely, and I, I, I thank you very much for you know listening in. And if you have any other questions, please let me know. I'll pass on some links to uh, a few of the the work I mentioned. Um, thank you very much. And thank I'll you. be happy to answer that question. That's an important question. Thank you. you, you so I said earlier, there it's sort of a, a, a principle that every system of insurance has some cost involved in administering it, right? And uh, work sharing, for work sharing, it's a concern that it's not the worker who's free riding, it's the businesses that are free riding. And, and there again, the question is, do, do this, the cost from the free riding, which happens to some extent, is bigger or smaller from the benefit that you get from keeping workers in place and not being laid off. 
And so it becomes to some degree an empirical question. And the, the good news to some, to some sense is that a firm has to make a, a, a plan and has to sort of stand uh, by its plan. And the, the, the employment development department's role is to monitor firm's behavior, right? Now, the firm plays a pays a cost here because it has to reduce its total hours worked, right? So you, uh, uh, if, if, if a firm is willing to say, oh, I'm happy for everybody just to work at 75%, right? Then the workers get half of the 25% loss paid for unemployment insurance benefit. The idea is that that's not really advantageous to the firm or its employees if the firm is really doing well, right? Sure. So the, while some firms may try to game the system, the, the system has it, it, a variety of checks to make sure that that's not exploited. And one of the checks is um, that you have to have a minimal amount of earning of hours reduction and can't do more than a certain threshold. So you have internal checks, you have you know, the policing of the, of the plans, as well as you rely that most businesses wouldn't find it advantageous to cut hours um, when they're actually doing well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but again, that's a, that's a very good and important question. That's fascinating. Hill, Are there any, other, any yeah. other questions? Uh, I have one, yeah. one um, question. Till, does your research policy lab, et cetera, go beyond the unemployment into like healthcare or any of the other areas of society? So we have five broad areas. One is labor and employment. And other than unemployment, we also look at workforce training, for example. Uh, um, the, another, another area we spend a lot of time on is homelessness. Another mm. one is criminal justice. Uh, and the other one is social insurance, broadly speaking. That would include aspects of the tax system. We don't do healthcare as such, but we, we work closely with healthcare researchers and think about health as an outcome. Uh, so it depends a little bit what you have in mind, but we have several areas that are overlapping. We have a uh, avenue of service, we call it uh, the community service, and it is doing a lot of work right now to try to understand the homeless situation. Would you be willing to come back and talk to us about some of your findings in the homeless area? Oh, I, I'd love to. We've we've been invested in an amazing amount of work, and we've we're working very closely with the homeless initiative of the county, and the city, and have now an employee at the Department of Health Services, and I, we, yeah, we have invested a lot, and we're we're making the push in homeless prevention. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to move the the action upstream to seek to prevent some of the homelessness that's occurring. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to come back. That would be very worthwhile. Great idea, Tom. Do you look at uh, sections of the city on homeless too, like West LA and Santa Monica and all that? Hello? Oh, so sorry. Well, I, I, will you, do you look at sections of the city, specific sections of the city of LA uh, regarding homelessness, like West LA or like Santa Monica or something like that? So it, it depends the very much on the program we're studying. Many of the programs we study operate at the county level. Okay. And so then the question is, for example, could be, you know, why has there been so much enrollment in, you know, in Santa Monica and not in West LA? What are we doing right here and not doing right mm. in another area? It, it really depends on the program and our partner, what, what the issue is at hand. Well, you can count on me contacting you regarding a future program, I guarantee yes. you. Yes, <laughs> yes, I think, that's, I think that's wonderful. Thank you so much for being with Professor, us and agreeing to Professor, return. Yes. Okay. Yeah, what, just one more last question. What's your academic background? Where'd you go to school? Oh, I have a PhD from Berkeley. Oh, that's okay. Wonderful. And then wonderful. I taught at Columbia University for close Columbia, years. okay. And that's now I'm okay. Back. Right. That's okay. Thank originally you. Originally from Germany. I have a master's from Germany and I'm half German, half Italian. Oh, oh my goodness. What a great combination. Yeah. My kids grow up <laughs> trilingual, at least if, if it were up to That's me. That's a blessing. That. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you again for being with us today. And you clearly work with many crucial social issues. So it'd be fascinating 
to hear your perspective on homelessness at a later date. And I also want to say as a thank you for your time with us today, we will be making a donation to the Westwood Village Public Library in your name. Oh, and I guess we'll be much. making two <laughs> at some point. But again, this has been fascinating. And, and I, you could tell from the number of questions that there's a lot of interest in what you have to say. Thank you very much for having me. It's been, it's been a, a really an amazing discussion. And I'm happy to answer questions if they come up and, and share some of our findings and research. And, and again, happy to come back to talk about. Wonderful. Only. We'll look Thank forward you. to it. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Oh, and last thing, last thing for the members, our next meeting is next uh, Thursday, October 15th. We'll be doing a joint meeting with our sister club in San Francisco, Chinatown. It will be a special, I see that, Peter, it will be a special and fun meeting. So, Peter, you are, you know, you're right on it. Thank you all. Have a great week. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Bye-bye.